Okay, good morning, everyone. So welcome to IBM's Internet of Things, Maximo Transportation User Group. My name's Scott Shaleen. I work for ZPro Solutions in the business development and marketing, which is heavily involved in the Maximo industry. I'm the current transportation community group leader, and I do absolutely welcome your thoughts and ideas for future meetings. So please drop me a line anytime if you're interested in being involved with the Transportation Maximo User Group. Uh, at ZPro, we have revived the Transportation User Group after seeing it dormant for well over a year, continuing to move forward with quarterly informative meetings, which include end user presentations, subject matter experts on various use cases, feature spotlights, and of course, the latest IBM Maximo updates, specifically around focused the transportation community. So first, I'd like to thank the IBM team for continued support of the user group in making Maximo experiences the best they can be. In addition, I would like to thank all of the presenters for stepping up to share the transportation community, a snapshot of how their organization utilizes Maximo and a little bit about their use of Maximo through upgrades related to asset management information. And lastly, to our spotlight presenters, keeping us updated with tools and services to enhance your Maximo journey. So with that, today's full agenda, it's packed with valuable information uh, comprised into two and a half hours of a virtual meeting. So once things return to somewhat of a normal, the goal will be to host these meetings at various regions for full day's events in the spring and in the fall, in addition to keeping the webinars alive during the winter and summer seasons. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted to the transportation community's website. In addition, we'll have individual presentation slide decks with contact information if you'd like to get in touch with the presenters after the meeting. Uh, we've got a tight agenda ahead, so keeping on track, excuse the pun, let's get started with our first presentation by our featured guest presenter, Dr. Christian Roberts, Senior Vice President of Asset Management and Business Advisory for WSP to USA, and is also Deputy President of the Institute of Asset Management. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Thanks, Scott. Um, are you managing slides or am I managing slides? You you can manage your slides. You want, to, you want me to put them up? Yep. Okay. Um, give me one minute because I was I thought you had them on the screen. So um, I I can pull them up as well, Chris. Sorry about this, folks. Yeah, I've got I've got the first one up, so let me share my screen. That's probably okay. Mine's up, but it's taken a bit. You should be able to see that. Yep. Yeah. Um, I I don't know whether this is in the correct order, but I've got two presentations, and they're both sort of about the same sort of time. So I'll I'll just flick through this one, and then I'll jump over to the to the um, other one in a moment or two. So. Sure. Um, Scott, when I spoke to Scott, he he asked sort of you know what are we doing in the Maximo community and 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 um, to to give you some updates on some of the things which are happening in the world of asset management. I thought it would be appropriate to start with um, with the Institute of Asset Management because we are um, we've been around for a considerable amount of time, and I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that we've um, I'm never entirely convinced. I should say that we've um, expanded our reach into all of the various sectors which um, are covered by um, some of the Maximo user groups. I think we've got good representation in transportation, but I felt this was a good opportunity to just introduce ourselves to you and um, give you a little bit of background on who we are, what we're doing, um, and where we're focused over the next um, sort of 18 months out to five years. Um, of course, it's a very different time for us right now, as it is for everybody with COVID and lockdown, and it has certainly impacted how we conduct business, and it's got us thinking about how we conduct business. So I'll be uh, able to share some of that with you as well. So just in terms of who the, the Institute is, um, 
for those who don't know, we've been around since 1994. So you know, last year was our 25th anniversary. Um, I like to say we've been in start startup mode ever since. I don't think we'll ever move out of that startup mode really um, as the um, subject and discipline of asset management evolves, but also as as does the the need and requirement for um, professional societies evolves as well. So I think I think it's we'll, we'll forever be in startup mode. Um, we expanded internationally in 2010 and um, started out in the US and Canada. Um, I was fortunate or um, maybe unfortunate, depending on how much you you value um, being involved in a voluntary organization. Um, <laughs> Um, fortunate to be involved with this, as indeed I think was, I think you've got Terry O'Hanlon in a moment or two, so Terry was as well, so just a, a plug there for Terry's early support in this. Um, and, and since then, you know, we've continued to expand globally, so we've got um, ch chapters now in the UK, Ireland, Germany, um, Belgium, um, we've got a, a chapter in Singapore. Each chapter has its own sort of set of rules and um, and, and its own approach to running things, but we 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 all subscribe to the same mandate, and we all subscribe to the same um, sort of philosophies as well. So we are a global um, society with very much a local presence, local to the extent that um, it always amuses me when I read some of the um, some some of the rules for each chapter. Where in Singapore, you're not allowed to smoke opium in any of the chapter meetings, but um, <laughs> that is a a clear rule that is is put in the legal mandate over in, in Singapore. So our, our focus really is to ex we exist to promote the science and practice of asset management. And I'll talk in my next presentation a bit about managing assets and asset management. But when we look at asset management from a from a very broad context, um, what we're looking to try and achieve, what we're what we are very much focused on, is helping um, both the corporate journey as well as the individual journey helping individuals thrive in their careers and helping them um, with the, the knowledge and the qualifications, et cetera, the training to um, progress through their careers, as well as helping organizations understand how to manage their assets better, how to be um, better practitioners of asset management, um, what that means, and, and then helping them to um, um, really become more sort of um, robust contributors to society at large. Um, we exist not just for the people in the organization, but also for the benefits of the general public. And that's always been key to our spirit and ethos. Um, size, we're a network of over 35,000 professionals. We've got um, practitioners now in 158 countries. Our vision is to be the recognized as the leading international professional body. There are other professional bodies. We're very aware of that, and we have strong relationships with many of them through things like the Global Forum for Maintenance and Asset Management, etc. We're very grateful for the support of our uh, patrons. We have 33 patrons. This list isn't quite up to date, um, but it does cover um, certainly some of the, the older patrons, the ones that have been supporting us for the longer period of time and, and I think we last updated this list um, end of last year. So 33 patients, 33 organizations that have committed to progressing the discipline of asset management and I think that's um, pretty impressive, particularly when you see some of the names in here um, and the size of them and, and within the transportation space, you know, you've got the likes of Network Rail, the New York MTA is there, um, MBTA up in Boston and then Hong Kong M MTR as some big names in the transportation space um, globally that are helping to promote and, and drive forward the discipline for asset management. Um, just in terms of what we do, we're largely volunteer led. We work together and we work together um, in different capacities to, to both distribute knowledge um, as well as to develop and generate knowledge. Um, we're a professional organization, so we do have a membership body we have a magazine, we have you know, newsletters, etc. Um, we, we've introduced formal qualifications a couple of years ago, and we are in the process of introducing, it, it got launched this summer, a register of asset management professionals, which we are pushing forwards through to full chartership status, and I'll 
talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, we're a learned society. So what that means is we're very much about investing in knowledge, research, developing guidelines for industry and developing guidelines for individuals and organizations who operate in those industries. Um, we undertake projects and we collaborate with others. We've worked on all of the major international standards for asset management. We were um, the spearhead for um, PAS 55 um, back in 2004 um, and then um, updated in 2008. And of course, with ISO 55000 internationalizing the, the, the British standard, um, you know, we've been involved with that since the start and continue to, to be involved with that. And then the last thing that I think is worth mentioning is that we do endorse um, third party providers. So we've always taken the view that the Institute should provide um, a recognition of quality to third party providers to ensure that if if a if an individual or a company wants to receive training or wants to receive an assessment against something like ISO 55000, that they're able to go to the Institute and say, OK, can you give us a, a list of um, of organizations that provide that subscribe to your philosophy and your and your your approach and then provide a high high standard of integrity um, in, in training or in assessment. So that is something which we've got in place and there are endorsed trainers and assessors on our website. Results from what we do. Well, we you know, we've been at this for a number of years and we keep evolving it, of course, like everybody else does. Um, we subscribe to the global form of asset management um, for the 39 um, components of asset management or 39 elements of asset management. Um, we have a, a um, anatomy, which is a an interpretation of that. Um, the the Institute of Asset Management Asset Management Anatomy document, which has been downloaded now over 10,000 times worldwide, and following a recent push, um, we've started to uh, translate that into other languages. Um, the first off the bat being Farsi, actually, because of the demand for this in the Middle East. Um, we've produced over 20. Um, separate guides for those 39 components um, and we've got a handful more in in production and a handful more in the pipeline as well so that's an ongoing level of effort and with all of those we ask you know we they, they are kindly sponsored by organizations who have committed time and energy to helping to progress that particular um, subject um, that little bit further um, talked about the qualifications a little didn't mention next gen so i'll just stop on that for a moment next gen is our next generation of asset management professionals and it's a way of bringing together those people who are new to the discipline whether that's because they're at the beginning of their career or whether it's because they've made a career transition um, we bring those together and we work with them to help help them on their individual journeys and we have a very active next gen group here in the united states um, a couple of slides on our future then. So, you know, COVID, like everything else, has produced, has resulted, I, um, I should say, in some challenges for the IM, um, not least for the fact that we've always been very much a physical networking type institute. We've, we've thrived off our um, annual meetings, our annual conferences. Um, we've had conferences in the UK, which has been the sort of home of the global institute for um, the last 20 something years and we, we started um, last year with the North American conference, which was a complete sellout. So it was well, very well received. Um, we've always thrived on that. We have um, 15 branches. I think it is now across the, the US with two to four branch meetings each per year. And of course, that creates an opportunity for networking as well. Um, and so with with our Physical interactions somewhat limited. We are moving to provide digital, um, di digital collaboration, digital services more so, um, and we've been looking at different ways to um, to achieve that and to provide that as a, an opportunity to our members. Um, the individual journey. Well, right now we have a an, an asset management body of knowledge um, that is being. Um, it, we've, we've, we've just recently actually end of last year taken that down to update it as part of um, a website 
uh, overhaul, um, but that will be going live again later this year. Um, but there is, but there is knowledge on there. We've just taken down the wiki that was there previously, which was on an older platform. Um, we have a certificate program and a diploma pl program, both of which you can sit that exam now from the comfort of your home um, through the Pearson View network. Uh, or through the Pearson View network of exam centres. Um, and as I mentioned, we are in the process of launching globally the um, asset management professional designation, um, which is a recognition of individuals who um, have reached a level of, of uh, capability and qualification um, and have the experience as such. Um, part of that is a route through to chartered asset management professional um, which is something which is more aligned to your professional engineer status in the United States. But um, the concept of a chartered um, professional is something that's um, far more familiar to those who are um, in the in the UK and Europe. So that is on the horizon. Um, we've been given preliminary approval for that and, and we'll be continuing to push that forwards um, over the coming months. The, the other side, um, as I mentioned, the corporate journey, well, we're continuing to offer those networking sessions. We're, we're running a series of webinars. We've got our virtual conference, which I'll plug in a moment. Um, we are continuing to provide access to um, the, the body of knowledge. Um, and we do provide organizational assessments as well. So that's something to, to look out for. Um, and, and with all of that, you know, we, we provide, I think the biggest thing we're, we're providing right now is that mentoring network to help individuals connect with others who may have the same problem and help resolve some of their issues. Um, last slide for me from the IEM is just a plug for our conference. Um, it's a we're moving it to a virtual conference. Um, it will be in November. We actually have two conferences in November, two virtual conferences in two different time zones, one at the beginning of November, which will be in a um, UK Europe time zone and then this one, which is in um, North American time zone. Um, slightly different themes, but there is a sort of a handoff from one to the other. Um, and generally speaking, we're trying to make it efficient for individuals to attend both conferences if they wish. And all of the content will be available to um, registered delegates following the conferences anyway. So just to plug out for those, if you're interested, um, we've still got a call for papers. Um, we've got, um, we've got, a pretty good submission um, list actually given where we are on COVID um, and the number of agencies that um, are somewhat prevented from attending conferences. Um, but we do have a, a strong list of papers right now, but there's still time to get one in if you want. Um, there's still time to sponsor both the conference and to exhibit at the conference. Um, we've got a, a very um, well-developed um, virtual conference platform um, that has been around for some time. So it's um, the, the services that we're using and um, we're very pleased with how it's looking right now. Um, and, and I think the last thing that I would say is, you know, if you are um, within a public agency, um, I know most public agencies right now are struggling um, to attend paid for events, whether they're virtual or in person. Um, I would just say reach out. You know, we are um, very open to providing either significant discounts or free tickets to public agencies and students for that matter. So it's something we've been um, we've built into our budget for that conference program for this year. Um, so with that, um, I'll just close on this slide. Just to say if you want more information, visit the website. Um, you can you can see what we're up to there. You can see the various webinars, etc. Or you can just drop us an email to our general inquiry email address and we'd be happy to connect with you. Um, I'll take any questions just why I uh, switch presentations. So if I'll just yeah, take a couple of minutes. And what I'll do, yeah, what I'll do, Chris, is I'll open up the chat window. So if somebody has a question, we'll uh, monitor that and uh, uh, give you that uh, particular question. Gotcha. So somehow I don't seem to be able to, okay, just looking for this other presentation. Okay. 
And at the end of each one of the presentations, folks, we will be opening the chat window. So if you uh, have a question, uh, we'll try to field those questions from the presenter at the tail end of their presentation. Um, at the very end of the webinar, we will have uh, an open session for about uh, five or 10 minutes of uh, Q&A as well, so. All right, Chris, you're good. Good, you can see a lot, yeah. Yep. Okay, so um, when Scott when Scott asked me to speak, he said, you know, we need to talk about Maxim, and I was like, well, okay, I'm not, I'm the first person to admit, and those who've worked with me will know that, you know, I'm, I, I know enough about Maximo to be dangerous, so I'm certainly not going to stand here or sit here, as it were, um, and, and try and convince you that I know more than I do. That's not my intent. Um, my my relationship with with the Maximo community has always been. Um, I suppose setting challenge and setting vision and working with individuals to um, to, to drive that forwards to, to help clients out um, to help client resolve the issues of the day um, whatever that might be and and of course you know we've got some pretty big issues of the day this year um, and from our point of view um, how we respond to the natural disasters, the pandemics, and everything else that's resulting from that, um, I think I think we need to start playing a, a role in that, and I think we've got a very important role to play in that as a community of um, um, asset management practitioners. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. Less so about how you use Maximo to save the world, more so about what we can all do to contribute to that and start moving things forwards. Um, just a quick intro to WSP. Um, we, we we work alongside with the Maximo community and we work within the Maximo community. We've been, our, our role has always been to focus on um, both asset performance, so how what you need to do to the asset in order for it to deliver services um, better, more, efficient, uh, more effectively, more efficiently, as well as the asset management community. So thinking about the organization um, and focusing on organizational change management, Focusing on business processes and practices, focusing on technology, <coughs> technology, and driving technology performance. Um, we do manage assets. We manage the California High Speed Rail, and we've got um, ZPro as a partner in that, um, which is a program of work to manage the onboarding of the assets. It's effectively managing the digital twin, and we're also managing asset information. Um, with the likes of Amtrak. So we're actually managing the digital twin with Amtrak as well as an ongoing level of effort to improve the asset management. So we are, we're rubbing shoulders with you guys all the time. And I think that's something which um, we enjoy and we'd like to very much continue doing. I'm going to talk a little bit in a moment about the difference between managing assets and asset management to pick that up in the Institute of Asset Management conversation, but I did want to just sort of focus on some basics, which is when we talk about asset management, what we're talking about is that collection of activities to manage the life cycle of the asset. It's to achieve organizational goals and service objectives, but it's a very much a life cycle view. It's a integrated approach that requires us to consider um, to, to make consideration of what we're trying to achieve with our assets very early on in the planning and design and acquisition stage and con continue to consider that right the way through to how we operate and maintain and rehab and even how we dispose of assets as well in, a, um, in an environmentally friendly and ethical way. So that's something which we've always been very much focused on. And when we think about that life cycle approach and we think about the work that we're doing in each of these different boxes on that on that cycle diagram there it really is about having a plan to manage risk it's about a plan to manage the risk that we design and build something that's not quite right and making sure that everything that we do through the whole process is addressing that that long term objective of the what is it that we're trying to achieve as an organization with our goals and our service objectives? So making sure that the plan, the design, the acquisition of assets, the operation and maintenance of assets is all aligned to um, delivering service. But of course, when you think about um, a plan, a plan is only as good as the context in which we set it. And of course, we set that plan with a set of 
sort of normal events which we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve a, a number of trains per hour. We're trying to achieve a, an amount of power load into a system. Um, a plan's only as good as um, everyone. Everyone has a plan, and and a plan is um, only good when we know what the what that situation is. And and that plan goes out the window um, when when we hit a, uh, a a series of events like we've experienced in 2020. Um, Mike Tyson put it better: everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. I think we've seen that in 2020. I think we've all been hit um, multiple times in 2020, and I think we're continuing to get hit as we move forwards. We started out with the pandemic. Um, it's only been eight months next week since the pandemic um, um, started, kicked off in, in the United States since it, since it entered the shores of the US. Uh, January the 22nd was the first case. And since then, we've seen um, significant change globally in how we are both operating assets and how we're using assets and our dependency on assets for the, um, for the economy as it stands and economic recovery as well. Um, when you look at what's happened within the economy, we've got the biggest cut um, in, uh, the biggest shrink in the, in the economy since World War II, um, an impact that's expected, forecasted to, to cost the, the US uh, $8 trillion by 2030. So that's, that's a significant impact. Um, it's a significant impact on our transportation systems. We've got most of our transit systems right now still experiencing around 60 to 80 percent um, down against where they were last year. And at the beginning of the pandemic, most agencies were 95 percent plus down compared to where they were last year. So you don't get much more of a reduction in, in customer use than that. Um, uh, Airports, airlines, still the same. I think um, the last report that I read said that they were um, last month 73% down against air travel against last year. So huge impact on on how we're utilising assets and an impact that's not likely to change in the short term. We've also had the um, the, the global um, the global unrest, the social unrest um, that that that's spawned from the homicide of George Floyd on May the 25th and has led to a very much a global movement to address racism and social un, un, uh, social injustice. Um, and that's something which, as we move forwards with our clients looking at um, how they're managing assets, we're very much focused on bringing in um, the sort of principles of social justice and equity into the conversation and making sure that we've got plans that address some of those things. Of course, on top of that, we've had the wildfires in Australia and in the US. Um, US wildfires this year, um, the top top six wildfires, top six largest fires ever on record um, appeared in 2020. And of course, you've got the, the most active um, hurricane season on record as well. So um, we're getting punched and we're getting punched an awful lot in 2020. Um, and that that is not going away. So when we think about resilience, resilience really is about understanding and developing capability to respond. Another boxer, sticking with that boxing analogy, um, another boxer put it probably a little bit better than I can, which is about it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. And I and I really do subscribe to that. When we think about resilience and we think about organisation resilience, we need to have a plan in place, but we also need plan B's, plan C's, plan D's to make sure that we're, we can continue to move forwards. Even if we have to move forwards at a slower, slightly different pace, we reduce the level of service we're providing, whatever it may be. But we do have to focus on how we move forwards. And when we think about moving forwards, we also have to think about what happens post pandemic, what happens post 2020 maybe. Um, and we start to then think about how we recover from the situation we're in now. Um, to understand how we address all of that, I did mention um, earlier about this concept of managing assets and asset management. And I want to just sort of describe that now because I do think it features into how we need to address things moving forwards. Um, when we think about what we do and when we're involved with the operation and maintenance of assets, we're doing that physical work, we're managing work instructions, we may be managing those intervention levels through maintenance plans, et cetera, but we're doing that to achieve a level of service 
and organization outcomes. And that is that connection between the doing things right, um, so making sure that we do do our work efficiently, um, doing the right things, so making sure that the work we do is generally aligned to uh, um, achieving a series of asset outcomes, and then really focusing on extracting value from those assets, so setting the right object objectives in the first place. That last piece being the real focus of asset management. So when we think about moving forwards and we think about introducing organizational resilience, um, we're thinking about both aspects of this. Um, we're focused on how we do the things right, how we make sure that we're doing the right things, but we're also focused on what the right objectives are and our understanding of how those objectives will change both pre, during and post uh, an event, whether that's a, whether that event is a pandemic, a natural disaster, whether it's a um, a terrorism act, whether it's you know um, a change in um, the economy, whatever it might be, um, we want to make sure that we've got that plan in place. So, to improve organisational resilience, what we really need to start with is a is a very thorough view of how we are approaching. Um, both managing assets and our asset management practices. I've picked up a couple of areas here, just in the interest of time, I'm going to jump over to um, a later slide which talks about that. But in, in essence, what we're focused on is how do we make sure that we've got the essential pieces in place to respond to something like um, a pandemic or a natural disaster? And then how do we make sure that we've got that longer term view of what we need to have in place to recover from the event and continue to recover. And as you think about a pandemic or for that matter, a major global disaster like we're seeing on the West Coast right now, um, recovery isn't just about rebuilding, it's about rethinking some of these things as well. That's our organizational resilience. Of course, there's asset resilience that goes alongside that, which is about making things more robust against the, the events which we throw up against them. Those are the those are the boxes that are in the ring that are getting hit harder and harder each day or each year with each of these recurring events. And those are the things which we need to make sure that we were able to stand up and protect those assets from, um, from the next big flood or hurricane or whatever may come its way. Our approach has always been to, to start with that organizational review. We have a a model which we've used for over a decade now, which is mapped to all of the industry standards, but focuses not just on um, improving maintenance and capital program delivery, but focuses the organization on establishing um, robust um, processes and practices so the management system approach. Uh, and it's that management system approach which helps you control risk. That's why we have a management system. We put in place management systems to control risks. So establishing those management systems um, helps us to identify what those risks are and helps us to make sure that we've got control processes in place such should those risks um, materialize. We've been doing this with with a number of the transportation agencies and, many, and, I, and I think we've probably covered all of the major um, rail and transit agencies in, in North America as well as um, a number of the other um, transport organizations like ports, airports, et cetera, over the last decade. As we move forwards, I mentioned that asset management system. Um, a key part of that asset management management system is having a plan in place for how we change that system through the course of an event. So what do we do to prepare for the event? What, what are the alert signals? How are we going to respond to each of those alert signals? What's the controlled set of processes we put in place to respond to that, whether it's um, starting up the incident management center, or whether it's starting to identify where we've got um, spurs and making sure we've got the right spurs in place, et cetera, to, to manage ourselves through the event. There's the activities that we do during the event. And then of course, there's the, the recovery aspect um, following the event as well. Um, I've highlighted the information because most of the FEMA um, FEMA guidelines um, that 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 are that organisations are using to to create continuity of operation plans right now don't pick up on the fact that it's 
absolutely critical that we have information about the current state of the asset, its current performance capabilities, where we've got issues or risks with the asset, um, and, and we need that in order to, to move forwards. One of the um, quotes that I got post Superstorm Sandy, um, this was from a, um, from a New York MTA representative at the um, 2015 State of Good Repair Roundtable. Yeah, this very clearly shows the challenges they had on hand. Um, it was not so much about the fact that, I mean, equally, they had issues with the, the assets um, being flooded out and, and severe damage across the network. But, but part of the challenge in that recovery was actually un, an understanding of what they had, where it was, what the devices um, were made up of, what the state of those devices were, and where, and where we had um, stock and inventory to support the recovery effort. That is something which we've continued to see in agencies across the globe is just that lack of asset information and the condition and information about the asset really does uh, impact um, the organization both during um, a an extreme event like a superstorm like a, a flood like a hurricane um, as well as how they can then move forwards from recovery and i think that's it's it's very important for us as proud practitioners who work in the asset management space, but are largely focused on the information about the assets and about what we're doing to the assets to, to have that front and center of mind that, you know, we're, we will play a very important role in helping to continue to move forwards through the pandemic, as well as helping to position the organizations for future resilience post pandemic. My last slide um, is really focusing on the lessons learned from 20, uh, 2008, um, the last um, big recession, and how we move forward. We, you, you will hear within conversations within the within the news about um, economic recovery. You'll hear about stimulus packages. You're probably even involved with some of this right now. And and we've and we always tend to talk about shovel-ready projects. Those projects which have an immediate impact on the economy. Things which we can get ready get going straight away they're the projects where we can invest a, um, a ton of money we can get people to work in the short term um, and of course that that then helps drive economic recovery that's what economic stimulus is all about the problem with that very short term view is that it burns out very quickly and in 2008 that's exactly what we saw um, what we what we experienced was those shovel ready projects Maybe the list wasn't long enough to be fair, but that list of shovel ready projects got quickly um, swept up and we were then having large amounts of time um, between the next list of projects that became available. Um, so the, the continuation wasn't there, which is why the recovery after 20, uh, after 2008 was a, was a bit stop start. Um, the, the lesson learned from that was to have planning ready projects was to have projects that are not just in the in the ready for acquisition construction stage, but those projects that were ready for the design stage so that that would provide the second level of stimulus, um, provides a slight deferment on the impact of the, of the, on the economy, but it enables you to continue that um, economic recovery, not just in the short term, but in the medium to long term. And of course, the other thing that we need to think about this probably more so now than back in 2008 is investing in the organizational capabilities of the future because we do have a very high age base within our organizations and there is an awful lot of individuals um, who are looking forward to retirement over the next five years or so so we need to be making sure that we are investing in both the assets from a shovel ready and planning point of view, but also the organization to make sure we've got the people there to continue to manage the assets. It's the people that manage the assets at the end of the day. So that's my last slide. Um, I've put up my contact details, but you've got it in the. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. In very informative and like you mentioned, yeah, we got we got punch pretty hard in the stomach here uh, for 2020 and everybody's kind of going through this recovery mode currently right now. So um, again, uh, these presentations will be uh, posted 
uh, at the end of the session on both the IBM user community website and the Zpro uh, events website as well. So staying on track, I know we've got a really tight schedule. Um, next up, we will uh, be chatting with uh, with Terrence with uh, Maximal World Reliability Web. It's going to give us an update on Maximal World and uh, kind of what the status of uh, where we're at right now. So Terrence, are you uh, are you with us? Yep, with you. Uh, if I could just share my screen, I'll put my PowerPoint up. Perfect. You're good to go. All right, let's see here. Keep that there. It's not letting me share the screen for some reason. Uh, let me see, Terrence. I, I, I've just made him oh. a projector. Okay. There we go. Projector. Per, uh, yeah. Presenter. <laughs> That's the right word. That, there we go. that works. All right. There we are. All right. You're good to go. All right, excellent. Thank you guys very much. Very good to good, very good to be here. Great, uh, great presentation, Chris. Uh, fantastic. Hard to follow that. Well, I think many of you have heard by now. Uh, and, and Chris said a really great, uh, you know, great sentence in there. We've all been punched in the in the solar plexus with COVID. Uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, it's been a tough a tough year, twenty twenty, and we think maybe even twenty twenty one is going to be fairly tough. We're 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 hoping for the best. We're planning for the worst we you know we we had to um reschedule is the is the as the Afro, aphorism we're using to we moved maximo world from august to december and relocated it with our imc our international maintenance conference because we could hold the bulk of the conference outdoors but we have determined even that's going to be difficult for us to do safely so um so we we have actually canceled all conferences in 2020. So in other words, our reliability conference that was originally scheduled for Seattle in May canceled our, uh, our, our Maximo World Conference, which was originally scheduled in August 2020, canceled, and our International Maintenance Conference, which was scheduled for December 2020 in uh, Marco Island, Florida, canceled. So we're back on to a 2021 conference schedule. We have canceled uh, the Reliability Conference 2021. That was scheduled for May. We just don't think things are going to be back on schedule for a spring conference. Um, and Seattle's got its own issues, but we are uh, anticipating Orlando August 3rd through the 5th, 2021, back at the Disney Dolphin and Swan Resort, um, uh, Maximo World to be back at its own uh, usual strength, at least we're hoping for so. You know, I think our actions in 2020, uh, you know, back up, we will not hold a conference if we, if we don't believe we can do so in a safe in a healthy manner. Um, we gave up a lot this year with that stand, and we're going to continue with that stand. We will not compromise in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we are anxious to bring the community back together again. But we will only do so when it's when it's reasonable to do so. Um, we will be doing a number of things online to bring the community together, but that's not re really what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to you know hope that we can bring uh, Maximal World back live. You know, I, 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 as I say, all I can do is provide that message of hope right now. Stay tuned. Uh, we, it's planned for August 3rd through the 5th, 2021. We would really appreciate it if you could pencil it into your calendar and stay tuned. We'll, we've been transparent. We'll stay in regular communication with you. Uh, Maximo user groups will do what they usually do. They'll have August 2nd as their get together. We will do another Maximo benchmarking on August 2nd. And this time we're adding a new workshop building digital twins with Maximo on August 2nd as well. Um, just as an FYI, we did move the reliability conference, which features maintenance 4.0, together with the International Maintenance Conference. So if you're penciling and you have a fondness for the world's most beautiful beach that's on in the 48 states, the JW Marriott Marco Island, December 6th through the 9th. Uh, those two conferences are now co-located. So we'd love to have you come down there. That is an incredible resort, uh, $1,200 hotel rooms for about 200 bucks. Uh, bring your significant other and you'll be a hit for the year. Um, we are, by the way, continuing with the awards programs for 2020. So if you applied for a Maximo World Award, a 
a solution award or an uptime award. We're doing those awards virtually. There is no cost. Uh, we've got some really fantastic keynotes. Uh, Keith Clark, uh, from from the UK, former CEO of Adkins. We uh, we have. Um, uh um, I'm sorry, Ben uh, Ben Pring uh, talking about AI and, and uh, machine learning. So we've got some really fantastic keynotes. So December 8th and December 9th, uh, watch for those registration links coming your way, as well as the Uptime Awards, Maximo World Awards and Solution Awards. Those will be announced in about the next 30 days who the winners are. Um, remember, three days of peace, love and asset management, Max Stock. Keep it in mind. And just to stay in touch with us, free subscriptions to Uptime Magazine are available at www.uptimemagazine.com. And I really appreciate this opportunity for the Maximo, World, uh, Maximo Transportation Group letting us come up, letting us do, do this announcement here. Great presentation again, Chris. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to speaking to you guys again. Thanks for this opportunity. Thanks, Terrence. Appreciate it. And thanks for the update on Maximo World coming up. Good information. So, so I, I know we, we again are on a, a pretty tight uh, time slot again. Um, we do have our next presentation by Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit, Smart Dealy and Tanner and Brian Cowley, uh, followed up by a spotlight on uh, RPA. Uh, followed up again by a presentation by Maximo on what's new in Maximo Scheduler 7.6.8. And then uh, a spotlight on Project Tech, which will be talking a little bit about their new, more uh, digital community for Maximo, which is, uh, which is a great, uh, great community as well. Um, so with that, um, I am going to turn this over to Tilian and Brian. Good morning. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, T. Leanne and I are going to be co-presenting for our uh, Maximo refinement project we've been working on uh, for the past few months. So, T. Leanne, if you could please share your screen and uh, we'll get Great. our presentation kicked off. Do you want to pull off. up your, I'll stop sharing mine. And you guys are able to hear me okay? I at the beginning of this webinar plugged in a yep, brand new microphone. Yeah, we can hear you fine, Brian. Okay, great, so it's actually working. All right. You can pull up your, your slide deck, Brian, or as Tilly. Uh, Tealy is going to be running the slide deck. Gotcha. OK, now I'm unmuting and let's see if I can get the slide deck up. There you go. Good morning, Tealy. Good morning. And Tealy has done several presentations in the past with I know with the Northern California Maximo user group as as well as uh, I believe at Maximo World and things like that. So she's uh, very well versed in presenting. Ah, can you see my screen? Not yet. Oh my goodness. OK, I do not know what's going on. Brian, you might have to take this because my uh ski screen is not sharing all right i will give that a shot we'll see how it goes let me, let me well just... let me try one more time hold on all right can you see my screen there it is yep okay let me do from beginning and see if this will work there we go now can you perfect see yeah yep. yay okay all right okay. It's all you guys. <laughs> all right, excellent. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Uh, so good morning. Thank you everybody for uh, taking the time to join this community meeting. And uh, we are from Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit. And Tilly, if you go to the next slide, please. Today, we're going to be talking to you about removing imperfections to improve our Maximo product here at SMART. And my uh, thing is in the way. There we go. So basically, uh, T. 
to give a little bit of background of how we got here today, uh, T. Leanne Tanner is a, a relatively new hire here at Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit, and we brought her in and she took over our Maximo system. I worked on the implementation and ran the system for the first two years and kind of got us from nothing to having a pretty good idea of what we want to do. Uh, T. Leanne then uh, came in after that um, when I was promoted to IT manager here at SMART, and she's really taken a new lens to our system and had a fresh perspective and has really been able to quickly clear up a lot of our log jams. So this uh, presentation is going to kind of go over how we got there today. So you'll have two presenters today. The first is T. Leanne Tanner, who is a uh, Maximo system administrator. She's been working in the system for 21 years, and we uh, got her from Sonoma County Water Agency, where she was their Maximo specialist for quite a long time. Uh, we brought her right across the street to Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit. Uh, we were looking for a Maximo person, and she was available, and we we're glad to have her. So she brings a wealth of experience with Maximo, um, as well as uh, a lot of fresh perspective that has helped us to really improve a lot of systems. Um, myself, my name is Brian Crowley. I'm the Information Systems Manager here at SMART. Uh, so kind of my role at SMART is to manage all of the technology. Uh, I used to be focused just mainly on the operations technology and our Maximo system, and now I'm running everything, and T. Leanne has taken the reins on keeping our ops tech working and giving constant improvement to our Maximo system. So uh, we both work for Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit, which is smart. It's a rail transportation system. You've got a map up there and a little bit of a summary of what we do. Uh, we're a special district in Marin and Sonoma County, and our project is to provide rail transportation and a multiple use path, which is a pedestrian bicycle pathway uh, connection all the way through Marin and Sonoma County. So I've been on this project uh, as a consultant and then was hired on uh, to the agency directly. I've been working on this since 2009. So I've kind of grown up at SMART and it really is kind of my pet project and I'm absolutely proud to be working here. Uh, we've uh, worked through a lot of interesting times uh, since startup. We've had a few fires, uh, we've had some flooding, we've had a pandemic. Um, and so much like Chris was talking about earlier, uh, we really try to be as agile as we can and keep our equipment in tip top shape uh, because you never really know what's going to happen. Our our latest uh, interesting thing that's been happening is all of this COVID stuff that I'm sure y'all have heard of. Um, and so our response to this, uh, we have uh, doubled our cleaning protocols. So we have staff that do full disinfecting measures on the trains twice a day. Uh, we have uh, we do it overnight uh, before our morning service runs out. And then also there's a midday gap in service where we can do quick maintenance on our rail cars uh, at our rail operations center in Santa Rosa. So our wonderful vehicle maintenance staff, they wipe down everything in the whole car. We have electrostatic sprayers that sanitize all the services. We have uh, in our bathroom, there's a hand washing station so people can continue to wash their hands often. And we have also installed uh, the uh, hand sanitizer dispensers all throughout uh, the car. There's a few on each car. We sweep, we vacuum, we mop. And it's uh, it's it's frankly, it's really impressive how quickly these teams are able to clean these cars. I, I call it paramount to like a NASCAR pit stop. The train rolls in, we have crews descend upon the cars and uh, they just go nuts and get it super, super, super clean. So we're working really hard on on keeping our our machines really clean. And so uh, back on the previous slide, we had a couple of pictures of our rail cars. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about that, and then we'll get into kind of what we do with Maximo at Spark. Uh, 
Uh, so we're a 46 mile railroad. We have uh, DMUs, which are diesel multiple units. And uh, we have uh, nine two car train sets. We can configure them into three car train sets as well um, and sit at the station and not block the, the street. And so we can kind of scale with demand. And what's really nice about having diesel multiple units, as opposed to your typical locomotive hauled type of rail transportation, is that the power uh, scales with the size of the train. So no matter what size train we're running, we're able to meet the exact same schedule. So it accelerates just as fast. It breaks just as fast. And uh, they're, they're all really quiet uh they're not that loud when they come in they're very clean we're running tier four compliant uh 760 horsepower uh clean diesel cummins engines on there and uh they're a relatively new car design and um they're just they're really great pieces of equipment that it's just super cool to work with it's uh kind of like going into you know the airlines or something if you see the pictures there they're really nice cars and it's it's kind of cool to be able to come into work and work with these really awesome pieces of equipment um and so we've been running service for a couple of years now and uh covid has definitely been uh, impacting our ridership but we're doing everything we can to keep these trains running for all of our essential personnel uh so we're going to go ahead and talk now on the next slide about how we specifically use Maximo here at SMART. So a little bit of a history lesson. We started, uh, we had a conversation back in probably 2012, 2013 of, hey, we're going to have all these rail cars and stations and switches and track. How are we going to track it? And uh, we talked briefly about a spreadsheet and when we kind of looked at the scope of what we need to do, uh, it became extremely apparent that we needed to have some sort of asset management system, maintenance management information system. And the better we could unify everything into a single system, uh, the easier it would be to track the complete life cycle of, of everything from asset acquisition to maintenance to disposal from ordering parts and storing them and issuing them to work orders and then uh, figuring out what was the cost of those parts and being able to run reports. And so we looked at a few different types of asset management systems, some that were tailored specifically for rail, but they were really small, others that were you know, less expensive, a little more simple. And the more we looked at the market, the more clear it became that Maximo was the way to go. Uh, it's you know, a, a system that has a wide distribution and we felt that we could benefit from user groups and things such as this Maximo Transportation where uh, you have a, a good group of people that if you do have problems or you're looking for examples of how other people have done things, that information's out there and we don't have to invent everything. And so we uh, went live on Maximo in 2016, it was November 2016. So we've been running the system for about four years now and kind of our most, our most prominent use of the system is using work orders for both scheduled and unscheduled work. So uh, our operations team, they do uh, calendar day required inspections of rail equipment, of track, of switches and uh, then the facilities team they work on our station platforms keeping everything clean and operating and you know everything from changing light bulbs to pressure washing to recharging hvac coolant and so what happens is we log all of our work both planned and unplanned in maximo through the work orders module but then we also have it tied to purchasing and inventory so we track time and material expended uh, on work orders and we can then also uh, handle for material procurement all the invoicing so all of our purchasing is also done through maximo as well uh, we have a whole bunch of assets that we track in there a whole bunch of locations and then uh, so that's sort of the maintenance side of it 
in addition to that, I'm also going to talk a little bit about our dispatch and our IT department. Um, on the dispatch side, we have a log that the dispatchers use. Uh, it's a piece of the health, safety, and environmental part of Maximo. So we create daily logs and we have all different kind of events, uh, stuff like maybe a truck drove into a crossing gate and broke the gate. We would log that or someone needs to get on the track to do some maintenance. They log that. And so sometimes these log entries will generate some work and uh, in in our theme of trying to track the complete life cycle of everything that happens uh, T. Leanne has been working with the operations department to help link our operator log all the way to work initiation and completion so she'll be talking a little bit about that today but the high level summary is that something happens the dispatcher or controller supervisor as we call them will log the thing that happened and then create a service request which then pushes it to work order and it goes through our whole work process so what's really cool about that is we can link the uh maybe a just-in-time purchase of a gate arm to the actual log entry of uh what caused this purchase so we can see we use this gate arm to fix this gate. Why did we do that? Because there was a work order. Why was there a work order? Because a pickup truck ran into it on Tuesday at 8.54 a.m. Um, so it lets us have really, really good tracking of everything. And then on the IT side, uh, a little bit selfishly as I moved into the IT manager role, um, I didn't feel like learning a new system after having my head buried in Maximo for four years. So uh, I, moved my department into we needed a call tracking system uh, we didn't have one at the time and i looked at a couple it specific ones and went to a couple of maximo conferences and asked for a show of hands of who uses maximo for it call tracking and nobody raised their hand so i saw that as an opportunity to just sort of figure it out and so we do all of our it service requests uh, anyone who has a computer problem or whatever, they email an email address and then that email listener populates a new service request in Maximo. And it's been a great tool for keeping all of our issue tracking in a single place. Uh, there's no more of the, you know, hey, I told the IT guy my mouse didn't work and uh, nothing ever happened and it's still broken because as long as people send us a ticket, the only way that's going away is if we get it resolved. So it helps us really make sure that we have uh, 100 percent completion rate on all of our IT service requests. So moving forward in the system, um, we've got a few plans that we want to do. Um, a lot of our inspections involve recording values such as uh, the distance between two pieces of rail or what's the diameter of a wheel. And so typically the inspector will note, hey, this is out of compliance or nearing a out of compliance situation and we need to create some work. What we'd like to do is using condition monitoring and meter readings is automatically generate work when a meter reading that is nearing an out of compliance state is uh, entered. Uh, our work right now, uh, kind of the best way we search for completed work orders is you sort of type in what you think the description is or you look it up by the department and we want to have uh, kind of better categorization and better classification of work orders um, so we're working on developing work order classification and getting some more uh, breakdown about specific types of failure modes um, and so that way we can see you know what type of failures are we devoting most of our resources to uh, we're also working on doing some more detailed tracking of uh, some of our assets, uh, especially in the signal side, stuff like software version or um, perhaps IP address. And so we're using specification templates to get some more detailed tracking of the specific attributes of our assets. And uh, one thing that's always been on our radar is moving to a mobile solution for Maximo. We, when we first started, uh, we thought about jumping into mobile, but 
without really having had a asset management system at all or having a lot of experience with Maximo at all, we decided to hold off on it uh, until we got a really good definition of how it works. Uh, because if we're kind of trying to evolve our work processes as well as evolve our mobile implementation, uh, then you've got to do everything twice. But now we're getting really, really close to thinking we really know how we're going to use it, what we're going to use, what we're not going to use. And so we're. I, it seems like we're getting real close to uh, being able to move to implementing some sort of a mobile solution so that we can uh, do work in the field instead of uh, logging it after the fact or waiting until you have to get to a laptop. So that's kind of the high level overview. And with that, I will turn it in, turn it over to T. Leanne, who will get into the meat of uh, what we're really doing with the system. T. Lee. Thanks, Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Um, I appreciate the wonderful overview of SMART. You definitely did a great job. And we will just start jumping through these slides. Behind every complaint, there is an opportunity for some kind of improvement. We need to be open to listening to our users. We need to ask questions that will help them open up to reveal the exact action within Maximo that is causing them some kind of grief. Over the years, I've found that many of the complaints either stem from lack of training or really simple fixes to either the data or making something automated. Each step we take to improve the product will get Maximo closer to being golden. Keely, your audio's not coming through. My audio's not coming through? Oh, there it is now. Gotcha. Okay, so the last two screens you didn't hear? The one screen we did hear, this particular screen we don't. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, I'll just say it to you. There are many <laughs> times when the controller supervisors are dealing with multiple issues at the same time. There's a delicate balance between getting everything recorded for FE, FRA requirements, addressing urgent matters at hand, and ensuring the crews are dispatched with all the information needed to properly take care of the various issues. My hat's off to them, but there is an easier way to do all of this. Um, but sorry, is there an easier way to do all of this? And that's what we've addressed in Maximo. Are you hearing this? Scott, I think the slide animation is blocking her voice. So I think she's gonna have to wait till the animation is through and then speak to the slide. Yep, I think you're right, Michael. Okay, I'll go ahead and speak to the slide. Uh, before we started our change in process, there was no connection between the operator logs and the field work records. Hand duplication of records opens the possibility for variances between systems. 
That's the can of worms for the FRA audit. Many didn't have what we needed out of the box. We made many configuration changes. Those included audio filling fields, drop down lists, tables, and automated emails. We now have the logs in Maximo. Less is more. The fewer systems we have, the less maintenance they take, the more resources we have for the most important tasks we do, keeping the trains running. It's a good thing that paper is renewable resource because we currently need a lot of it. Our goal is to be able to print the FRA reports if we are asked to do so. This will greatly reduce our costs and help the staff focus on their jobs getting done in dispatch and on in the field. The new configurations with our Maximo reports we are developing will help us to do just that. Requirements filled at a moment's notice with a few clicks in Maximo. We will show you how we did it. Um, let's talk about configuring in Maximo versus cu customization from um, outside of Maximo first. When you configure something within Maximo, when you do your upgrades, it goes with the upgrade. If you do something outside of Maximo and it's customized, then when you go to do your upgrades, you have to redo everything. So I just wanted to let you know everything that we've done within Maximo. Um, has been within Maximo and will go with an upgrade. We will not have to do this twice. Uh, to consistently fill the appropriate information into FRA reports, we needed the fields in Maximo. For the grade crossing issues specifically, we have a whole section of fields that are revealed when that issue is chosen. We narrowed the search parameters to only include grade crossing assets and locations. That's A up there. B, we created domains or pick lists for several fields. And C, we created a table for the trains with a pick list. And D, we autofilled the time notified with the moment the line is added. Uh, just to test Brian to see if he's still there, uh, Brian, can you tell us the shortcut for adding time uh, when you go back into this field and you want to just add the time that's right now? There's a shortcut. I do agree that there is a shortcut key, but I don't have that one memorized. Oh, darn. OK. <laughs> I was thinking that you knew the shortcut key. It was, it was something on the keyboard. All right. Well, at least we know you're still here. So to burn through the steps, now that uh, the information has been has a field of Maximo and can easily be seen in its place, it's time for uh, notifications. Nothing is as fast as a phone call, of course, for the crews, but once they are dispatched, the electronic information can be sent out to all the right places with a couple clicks in Maximo. We added to the create service requests uh, window all the field information that we wanted to end up on a work order or in an email to the stakeholders. And you can see uh, that we have uh, done some automated fill uh, for the work groups, the reported by, and the day and time. The summary is just the name of the location so that when they see it in the work order tracking, they know it's a grade crossing issue and where it's at. And uh, the details were also put in from the details of the operator log. So now the controller supervisor does not have to retype anything in Outlook, nor will the crews have to hand enter the same information into Maximo either.
This is a sample of the email sent out and the record of the communication log in the, uh, to the crew. We have saved approximately an hour or two a day of staff time by this step alone. And that's, of course, if there's more than one issue, they're gonna have to repeat that. So I decided to do a little cost analysis just on this one step. If a staff member only costs us about $100, and that's with benefits and everything, then an hour, uh, since we run this, the trains 365 days a year, and this is of course on non-COVID time, this step alone could be saving us about 36 to $73,000 annually. That's a pretty big savings. And that's only one of the steps that we've created here. Once the controller hits OK on creating a service request, we have escalated the grade crossing issues directly to a work order. Our justification for this is that it is a requirement by the FRA, and FRA, if you don't know what that means, is Federal um, Railway Association or Administration. Uh, anyway, it, our justification for this is that it's a requirement by the FRA to physically respond to an issue, even if it's a false alarm. This means there is no need for an approval process by their supervisors. With all the information needed from the operator log already in a work order, the crew can simply add the failure codes, their labor, and complete the work order. This is saving them quite a bit of time. Less time in Maximo means more time for the field. Let's keep those trains running. Now that all the information is in Maximo and only hand entered once, we can retrieve the information in any report we want to make. This is an example of our Maximo BERT grade crossing incident report. Everything on the top comes from the operator log, everything on the bottom from the work order, which isn't much as you can tell. The controller supervisor has, um, has been hand typing this information into a Word document, printing it and filing it. We are currently still in test mode on this process, but think of the time and resources savings when we can run this only when the FRA asks and we can email the PDF. Oh, and don't forget that uh, any time that you change a process, we, you need to create some kind of standard operating procedure, some kind of training instructions. This is very important for uh, the, the people using the system to know that they are doing all the steps correctly, because if they miss a step, they might not make the emails. If they were to go straight to the service request, to create the service request. One, it'd take them more time, and two, that email wouldn't have been set, sent to all the stakeholders. So definitely there's gotta be training anytime you change a process. So here comes my refire, uh, <laughs> refiner's fire. Yes, again, Maximo is not the only thing needing the refiner's fire. My having starting this job during the pandemic and never having worked in the train industry before put me at a great disadvantage to pre-organizing all the steps to this process change. Much of what we did was reactionary instead of pre-engineering it. With all the stakeholders giving feedback to the proposed process, that really helps with ownership. And had I really realized all the steps ahead of time and been able to hammer it out with people in the same room with the whiteboard and really talk about it, it would have been uh, far more advantageous, I think, for 
the implementation of a regardless um, the each individual thing has to be tested so even though we kind of did a reactionary okay this is what we need okay let's try it okay let's do it this is what we need okay let's try it let's do it it's really how you would have to implement it anyway because in all reality uh, if you try to implement a whole bunch of things at once if something goes wrong you don't know where it is so each thing does have to be uh, tested before it's promoted into maximum. So who knows? Scott was more excited about me revealing our cans of worms. So here you are, a few worms for you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> worms, by the way, make great bait to catch bigger fish to fry. And that's what we did. We ended up with escalating the service request to a work order because, unbeknownst to me, the field crew could not access the service request to make a work order. Only the supervisor could. And this cannot do turned out golden. It removed yet some more steps. Secondly, all this work we did, I found out recently has to have the final stamp of approval put on it by the FRA before we can use it. Say no more. As I was working with the controller supervisors to save them many steps in their process, I didn't realize what effect it was having down the process stream. At first, I was just getting them their report ability and Maximo, you know, create all these, these fields and make it happen. But the project kind of grew, and that's when we started automating things. Uh, those affected may have put up a white flag if they had known. So one of the side benefits was that we developed an ad hoc report for Maximo service request, uh, IT service request. Well, actually, they're not just IT. Any service request that has Maximo in it or has the location or asset of Max Maximo comes onto this uh, report. And that report gets sent out to all the supervisors and upper management so that they can all be aware of the projects that we are currently working on in Maximo and their status. Uh, we have everything from in progress to uh, new pending and resolved in the last 10 days. It all falls off if it's been more than 10 days resolved. We also have a couple more reports that we can uh, use the same grade crossing information that's already been put in for and uh, save more hand entries outside of Maximo. Taylor, we're about three minutes. OK, I got it. A uh, couple more of my personal refiner fires are that I really need to ask more questions. I could learn this best from my two-year-old grandkids. Why, 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 why? Only I should be asking three times uh, who, what, when, where, and how. Uh, that way, uh, we can dig down uh, it better into unfamiliar processes. My assumptions came with growing pains for others, but cost savings in the end. The, the service request straight to the work orders is a good example of that. Another refiner's fire is to know not everyone learns the same and what works for one may not work for another. For me in person has always been with the best results over the years. Besides asking many questions, the best golden nugget I have learned is this. Making Maximo user-friendly will save you more time and money than anything else you can do in the system. If it's not user-friendly, they will not use it, they will fight it, or they will give it a four-letter name. On the other hand, the sweetest moment, moment is when you automate some process and go to sh uh, show them how to use it. 
And with a click or two, they realize all the information magically appears. And they say, that's all. Are you sure? And they keep, keep looking at the screen to see if it's all there. And it is. Well, I've been talking your ears off. Uh, I would love to hear from you guys. And I would love to know what your golden nuggets are or what questions you have. Perfect. Thank you, Tilly and Brian, so much. Good information. Just wondering if there's anything you can do of maybe put in a corrective uh, maintenance uh, request for getting all the smoke out of the air. That would be a good one. I'll uh, <laughs> send that one off to. I'll delegate that one. All right. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, we're we're dealing with a lot of smoke here in California, obviously, as well as some other folks out there. So. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, and just, I know we have a really tight agenda trying to compress everything into two and a half hour webinar. So we are going to actually move into our um, next uh, sponsor spotlight, which will be on. Well, I just want to say yes, thank go ahead. you. And Sorry. if anybody has questions, they can go ahead and uh, email either Brian or I with your questions and we will get back with you. Thank you so much. Scott, you still there? Perfect. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, uh, I dropped for a second. All right, um, so with that, uh, Michael Hanscom is going to be running our sponsor spotlight on a little bit about a uh, new alternative to mobility. Michael, if you are ready. This is our RPA process, which is a robotics so process animation yes we can That's you're good, good to go okay all right michael morning or afternoon everyone whatever the case may be depending upon where you're at um what we'd like to present here is zipro solutions has teamed up with brilliant um corporation in developing a process to Take the paper forms that we all are near and dear to everybody's heart from all of those inspections that we do and make useful information out of that paper and then get that information into the Maximo system. Um, for various reasons, there are many, many corporations that cannot go to a true mobile solution, um, be it, you know, they, they can't afford the handheld technology, um, the environment in which they work, does not allow it so they have to still rely on their inspectors and their technicians filling out paper forms so what we've done is we've worked with brilliant in developing a system and a process that allows us to get the information off those paper forms digitize it and then have that information go over to maximo so that maximo through the um, business rules inherent to the system can then take further actions. The information is available for reporting and, you know, additional follow up. The actual system is, you know, it's, it's part of a cohesive solution of processes and features that happen. RPA being robotic process automa automation is just one piece of the entire ecosystem and it all plugs in with the S. Mike, I'm afraid we've lost you. Are you still there? Um, I should still be here. Can you all hear me? Can now, thank you. Yeah, now we okay. can. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I got the little message there. It says, hold on. We'll be right back. Um, so, you know, some of the benefits with this, you know, reducing the costs, increase the accuracy, increase the employee satisfaction is you know what happens with this so with the with this whole process and yes it does involve scanning so you know you have the form and a lot of us have these forms in maximo already we're filling them out we're hitting the check boxes so 
that that part's for most places is already there. And a lot of people are actually scanning these forms in for storing them for that historic need that, you know, never rises or sits on some data server someplace that nobody ever goes and looks at. So this whole process allows us to scan it in. The OCR and the intelligent data capture allows us to further take this information, slice and dice it a little bit more, validate it to ensure that we're getting the right bit of information that the technician actually meant to put on that form and then actually do some analytics with it. And I'm going so, sort of quickly because I do have a little demo that I want to show you and I only have 10 minutes and Scott will cut me off. So, you know, part of this um, machine learning and I do have Adam from Brilliant Technologies. He's also on the line here with me today and he's going to speak a little bit. Adam, you want to talk about this one a little bit? You're on mute, Adam. There you go. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I mean, in terms of the capabilities, for sure, there's, you know, um, it's identified here, there's machine learning um, to where users can actually train up these forms um, to be even more accurate. You know, you basically could start with, um, you know, um, our, our OMR zones, basically as optical mark recognition. Um, we, we see all these check boxes on the forms. And if those zones need to shift even just a little bit, um, if there's anything um, in there that, you know, over time might change, those can actually be trained, um, as well as working with different revisions of these forms. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so just kind of walking through what we see here, I mean, on the right is the original document. Um, you'll see, you know, basically everything in front of you as you go to the individual fields, um, they will flag if it goes, hey, we don't have a high enough confidence here. Um, we have, you can set the confidence per field. Um, so that seller reference number, that second field there, say if you wanted the confidence of that field to be 95% and above, then it will, if it doesn't hit that 95% confidence or above, it will flag it, stop it. The user has to then either visually verify or key it in if it didn't pick up anything. And actually on the right, you know, um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's incorrect. It just means, you know, confidence value, it wasn't met. So um, you can lasso it, you know, on the right, you can kind of select the text and it will pick it up. Um, if nothing is is selecting correctly there. Um, so that is a typical process. You can actually take a um, you can actually take a series of forms, um, you know, say if it's a, a directory of them and you can drop them into a, a folder that's watched. Um, the process can say sweep it every five seconds if you want um, and that will kick it off, essentially create the job and start extracting data and then you'll end up in this validation screen like we see here so, um, there are um, you know as identified here as well the multiple ocr engines um, you know it uses uh, some of the best in the industry uh, omnipage fine reader recostar um, there's also uh, google vision as well there's an api for that so um, if there's any text that's especially hard to read like a uh, Handwriting is is one of those. Um, there are there are ways to read handwriting, and actually we have some um, that we'll see here in a second. Thank you. Appreciate. It. So you can see that you know this process is tested. Um, it, it's deployed in multiple areas in both the federal government space in the private space. So the the concept. Um, isn't totally new for the OC, OCR type process. And the whole part of taking this information and then tying it into the Maximus system is where the system has come into things. So what I'd like to do is, I'm assuming that you all can still see my screen. Yep. Can you hear that too? Yep, got it. I'm sorry, Mike. I'm going to oh, disagree. The, I'm not hearing yeah, this. The uh, audio. audio from the video. Yeah. Uh, OK, so you're not hearing the audio? Not no. from the video. OK, well, the audio is actually just music. So <laughs> what's happening is, is <laughs> we scan in these forms and you can see how some of the areas are showing up in the red. And what's happening is, and I, I pause the form, is because of the way we set up the confidence and it's reading the handwriting over here, um it's not sure that hey do you have the right do we have the right information here so the user as they're reviewing the information you know after it's been scanned in they can go back and say oh yeah 
this is what it should be. So they have the ability that, you know, they can look at the form that was scanned in, look at the data that was actually um, read and say, yep, it's the right information or no, it's not the right information and correct that information and continue the process. Right. So it does it with these um, actions. And what happened here is some of these, you see how the check marks went into the other box? So it, it read that, hey, there's something over here, but it's not what we anticipated it's supposed to be. So that's why you get some of those, hey, are you, do you want this to be okay? Is it a defect? Then it validates. Just check the handwriting text is the biggest thing that it does. Your audio is breaking. Right, up we're, now. Yeah, we're losing you a little bit, Mike. Can you go ahead and pause for a second? And... Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good. I've muted the music there so that you all can hear me. So now what we're doing is now this is being this is where we have the integration into Maximo, um, and this is where the information shows up. And what we did for this example. Um, for this potential client was we actually tied it into meters and everything in the in inspection report, certain meters are safety related items. So if they get a safety related item, it triggers that, hey, this bus has to come off the road. You, you, the bus can't go out because we had a safety related item. So what we're showing here is as we integrated all the information into the system, we can show the observations like, no, there wasn't any safety related items or yes, there was a safety related item. And you can scroll down through and say, hey, I want to look at all the yeses. So these are all the issues that I had um, with the bus in my inspections. And I can then take and trend that information through the maximum trending. I can generate additional work orders from that in the system. So that um, it can follow up to care for those issues, those items that were um, realized. But the biggest thing that you know we're trying to show and have folks take away from this is there are alternatives to the mobile solution in those areas in which you don't have the ability to um, implement mobile, um, you don't have the technology to implement mobile, um, or you know just the environment doesn't allow a mobile solution to be utilized. So, Scott and everybody, I appreciate yeah. your time. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, Adam. And staying on track with uh, where we're at, uh, up next, we have what's the latest with Maximo Scheduler 768. Um, I know there's some enhancements that have been made to benefit the schedulers and the supervisors out there. So um, with that, Lori, are, uh, are you ready? Perfect. Okay, can you see my screen? We sure can. Excellent. Okay, so um, <clears throat> Shalab is actually going to kick us off if uh, you want to go unmuted. Yeah, thanks, Lori. Um, uh, maybe we should just do a quick introduction, Lori. Uh, once you uh, start off, and then I'll go next. Sure. Um, so I'm Lori Pilgrim. I'm one of the design architects for Maximo, and I've been working on the scheduled project uh, since 2013. And hi, I'm Shalav Prasad. I'm the offering manager for uh, Maximo Scheduler. And we wanted to uh, share with you the latest uh, release enhancements and uh, new applications and features uh, that we have released as part of Maximo Scheduler uh, 768. Uh, the release was G8 on July 24th, and we have made uh, quite a few uh, new investments in different uh, categories. Uh, we have new applications. We have done enhancements to existing applications, and we also done quite a bit of uh, refresh and investment on the optimization side. Uh, so on the user experience and data quality uh, for the new applications, we have graphical work week and uh, graphical uh, resource view and scheduler data manager. Laurie will be uh, showing a quick demo of those. Uh, graphical work week is for easily uh, scheduling and assigning in a single application. Uh, graphical resource view is for uh, managing uh, in one application your entire workforce uh, availability. 
and scheduler data manager is for addressing data quality uh, data governance issues as part of Maximo scheduler. Uh, we also have quite a few enhancements and RFEs that we addressed as uh, part of the uh, existing applications. And we'll go through uh, those two. Uh, one often requested one was the export to calendar, so exporting assignments uh, to the calendar. And on the optimization side, we've also done a, a full refresh of the entire stack. Uh, we have replaced the underlying engine to a different uh, product uh, from iLog uh, for scalability uh, performance reasons, uh, especially in the new world uh, for it to operate in a hybrid cloud mode in a container, uh, which can be you know, deployed across many clusters. We also have Maximo optimization framework uh, that we introduced to manage your deployments as well as make extensions to the optimizations. What we heard from clients often was that as they, uh, for the unique uh, requirements, they did want to extend or, uh, or tailor the logic for the optimization or the automation. Uh, for large projects, uh, for turnarounds and shutdowns, we introduced a new large project optimization model. And in general, we also improved the scalability performance of our existing optimization models for resource leveling and uh, capacity planning and assignment, uh, as well as dispatching for, uh, for, te for technicians. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, so with this, we also done uh, packaging changes. Uh, before we had uh, some level of complexity in our packaging, we had scheduler, scheduler plus. We also had uh, graphical appointment booking. Uh, so effective version 768, which got released in, uh, on July 24th. So for this new version, and this applies to Maximo, uh, EM7612. So we have consolidated uh, what used to be available within Scheduler Plus into Scheduler uh, and also graphical appointment bookings. So all of that has been consolidated into the base Scheduler license, which stays unchanged. What we have done also is we have separated out optimization into its own separate entitlement. And this is needed for use of the new optimization technology that we are shipping out and would include the new embedded iLock product, as well as the maximum optimization framework and the optimization models, uh, you know, that we have uh, built new as well as uh, refreshed, right? So with that, Laurie, uh, I'll turn it over to you to uh, to take us through the demo. Okay, um, I'll just do a couple of slides first, and then I'll get into a demo. So the, I'm just going to try and show you the the three new applications. Graphical work week. Um, this is something that our customers have been asking for some time. Um, we have a set of customers that we've been working with for a long time um, with very complex um, use cases, and we've been working on those. Um, so with this release, we've we've simplified and, and gone. Um, you know, heard the the requirement. I want to schedule and assign in one application. I don't want to have to jump between two. Um, I want to be able to do it um, quickly and easily. I want to be able to modify my availability um, quickly and easily. Um, and I'm going to show you this, um, both the scheduling and the assigning within this application, um, having that top bottom view and um, how easy it is to assign long duration work and multiple records at one time. And um, we've changed some of the colors that uh, will help you understand what's going on as well. Graphical resource view, um, much, much of the functionality from this app was put into the graphical work week, but um, instead of having to use that um, dialogue for modified availability that we all love so much and is so painful because you have to put a record in for every day of the week you're on vacation, etc. cetera, um, we've made it simple with this, you know, pick a reason code and double click on a, on a cell that represents a day of the, the month and um, <clears throat> be able to do multiple people at one time um, into a meeting or training or whatever, and I'll, I'll demonstrate that as well. And um, that is scheduler, um, scheduler Data Manager is a new application, and this is uh, to try and help customers with their pain points around, you know, I'm, I'm bringing up Scheduler for the first time, I'm bringing in my work orders, but I'm not getting um, good results um, or my screen doesn't display. I don't get any um, records. 
this is going to help you understand, um, you know, your, your data may be okay if you're just working at a um, work order tracking level, but if you're trying to schedule an assign, if you don't have any durations, you don't have planned labor, it's going to find all of those and allow you to fix it in line. So I'm going to show you all of those at this point. So I'm starting with graphical work week, and um, as you can see, it's that top bottom view. And I have all my work um, as we traditionally see in kind of a Gantt and table format. And underneath I have all of my um, crafts and the labor that are in, into it. So if first of all, what I want to do is look at my scheduling. Um, if I collapse my crafts so that I am looking at just my load and availability. So traditionally you had to go to graphics graphical scheduling to see the load and availability. But here what I'm doing is for each craft, what is the work scheduled on that day and what is the, the availability of the labor that I have? And that is including the modified availability of the labor or crews. Um, in this case, we can see I, I'm overloaded with my um, overhead line crews. So I might want to do a little scheduling prior to the time that I'm going to do my assignments just because I want to kind of maybe sort out, move um, work to the next week that is low priority or whatever the criteria is. So what I can do is select that overhead line crew and I can um, click on the filter here that filters all the work based on that craft. So now I'm seeing all of that work for that craft. And if I look at all my priority nines in this example, I can sort or filter by whatever value that makes sense for deciding what I'm going to move. And what I can do is just select all that work. So I, I've selected, you know, a number of records and they're actually all seem to be on the Friday, but um, this work will spread across the week. So what I can then do is just do a right click and set work today. And I'm just going to go ahead and move it into the next week so that my availability or my load is now zero on the Friday. So, you know, even though I'm over on the Monday and Tuesday, um, it, it's going to spread out and I might still have to move some more things to the next week, but um, we'll see as I do assigning. And the other part of this is if I expand this again, is that if you enable the sync option, which is a system property, um, it, there's a sync option that will align your scheduled dates to match your assignment dates. So as I um, make assignments, it will adjust my schedule dates to match it. And that's part of how this will actually work well. So if I was going to do some assigning, I really want to assign my week of work, right? So what I want to do is I'm going to select my carpenter craft because that way I get all of my unassigned. Oops, I'm just going to get rid of my filter up here. Um, that way I'll get all my um, unassigned work and any work that's assigned to these people that are carpenters. And I, uh, sorry, again, I apply this um, filter. And so now I'm only looking at the carpenter work at the top. I'm not looking at um, anything else. So I don't have to try and figure out which one I'm going to do. If I select something like a long duration work, which could have been a little bit painful in their graphical assignment application, I can go ahead and I've selected it up here and I'm just going to assign it to Elena by double clicking. And so since it spans multiple days, it's going to give me a dialogue. If it didn't span multiple days, it would just go ahead and assign it without any dialogue. But here we want to make sure that you understand it's going to split the work up, do eight hours on the Monday and six hours on the Tuesday. So when I say OK, what we'll see is that now I have no availability left on the Monday and only two hours left on the um, <clears throat> Tuesday. And then you can see that it automatically split that work order for me to make those assignments. So it becomes two assignment records in work order tracking. So then I can go ahead and select um, whatever work orders I want here and I can just go ahead and start filling my week. Right? So um, 
The one thing I notice here is that I have zero available hours and I have this new icon. So if I right click, what it's telling me is that there's view, um, there's an external assignment for this labor. So I can go in there and find out what that is and maybe negotiate to get them um, to not use my resource. <laughs> um, but uh, if I double click on the Tuesday, it's going to start making those assignments that I've selected above assigned across the days until they are complete. So then I say OK, and it starts to fill my week. And what you'll notice is that I have this new allocation. So it's starting to tell me that my days are starting to get filled for two of my carpenters. And I can go ahead and make assignments um, continuing through my crafts and my labor until I have my week pretty well planned. So the next thing what might happen is that now I get to Monday and somebody calls in sick. So let's say that um, Adina calls in sick. So I'm just going to remove my requirements here or my um, selections. I'm going to select a, um, a reason code for sick. And once I select that, I'll, and I'm going to say it's a full day of, of being sick, I can just double click on the Tuesday and it comes up and, and now it's red. Now I have eight hours of assignments and I have no, uh, you know, no availability because I've changed that to zero. So what I can do is I can right click on that one and just say unassign all. Um, sorry. So I can also select, I'm not sure what I just did there. I think my screen is frozen. Let's just do a refresh and see what happens. OK, so I did a, an assign all. It's showing blue for being sick. And um, it's unassigned that work. So now I could go ahead and assign it to somebody else. Um, so the. So the one thing I also I wanted to show you on the screen was that we now have um, reason codes. So for each of your reason codes for modified availability, we'll give you a color. Um, you can change these to whatever you want. You can add reason codes and add colors for them. Also allocation. So as I make allocation, like make assignments, um, the colors are going to change as I um, process or make assignments to that week. And so that is an allocation at the week level, very much like what we've seen in Assignment Manager. OK, so now I'm going to go to the graphical resource view and I'm just going to bring up a um, graphical view and I give it a minute to load um, and what you can see here is that I have a number of things um, already color coding happening in this application so much of the functionality is the same as what you've seen within um, Graphical Work Week, but this just allows you to only concentrate on, you know, deciding what your vacations are and, and that type of thing. So if I sort by shift and I want to put everybody in A shift, um, and you'll notice that we have A shift, B shift, C shift, and they're rotating shifts. And what we can do now is per um, day within that sequence, tell me whether it's nights, days, afternoons. So when they're on um, day shift, what I can do is decide that they're going to go into a meeting. And I'll just do full day and double click. And now I've got two people in a meeting for the full day. There's lots of features in here. I can't show them all. But one last thing before we return to the PowerPoints is that if I go into, um, sorry, graphical scheduling. I have a set of demo data set up with a lot of problems with it. And from any schedule, um, graphical scheduling, graphical scheduling, large project, graphical assignment, um, and graphical work week, you can just click from here and go into the data manager. And so what it does is it brings up the information about that um, schedule 
in this case. Um, you can validate your um, calendars and shifts because it's going to make sure that um, they are reasonable and that you have enough um, work periods to cover the um, dates of your schedule. Your query, we're going to look at best practices to see if they pass. In these two cases, they do. We're going to look at your work, and I've already validated this, and I'm finding out I've got problems with, um, so if I show only the errors out of my 189 records, I have 21 errors that I should take care of. So if I scroll a little bit over here, it's telling me my work order task duration is shorter than planned work duration. So I don't know what my planned work duration is just yet, but my work order duration is four. So I can open up this little dialog and I can see that my hours are 16. So I can change it to four here or I can change both um, four here and or six here, whatever. So if I put in four and say OK. And then if I revalidate. I'll go from 20. Um, it's a lot slower than when I did it earlier. <laughs> there we go. And now we should see that we have less errors, although that looks like that particular work order had another problem that came up. So, um, and then we also look at dependencies. So things like circular dependencies, I can actually bring up a mini Gantt. And in that mini Gantt, it's going to show me what my problem is. What's the circular dependency? Now within Maximo, you can't create such a thing. It won't let you, but many people load their data um, in other ways and it can be allowed. Um, you don't like it, but so I could right click here and delete that constraint or I can um, close this and I can just delete it here, right? So I have that ability to um, make those changes and save them in line. So whether I delete or whether I make a change to a field, um, any validations that um, we're doing, you're going to be able to see that um, you can change them right here without going back to work order tracking, although we give you that option too. Lastly, for resources, um, because this is scheduling, we're doing it at the craft level. We can see my load of hours is way above my available hours for this craft. And so I might need to um, add some more hours here by adding more people into um, my schedule. There's lots of things that I have to do, but this will let you know that you're not going to be able to schedule the work against the resources that you've got in the schedule. Okay, so I'm just going to go back to my PowerPoint and mention a few more things that are going on. Um, optimization. Uh, I think Shaleb described much, much of this already. Uh, so it's a new solution. Um, the models are all new um, and are available out of the box. Uh, the existing models that we had in past lives have just been rewritten in Java to make them more extendable. And um, we do now have a new um, server that we're using. Instead of using DOC, we are using um, our own uh, we call it maximal optimization framework um, and it is a lot easier to install. It's actually within a um, container and I think it's uh, uh, distributed that way and so and very scalable. Um, some other items, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at time here. Um, some other items that we have done with the with the applications is giving it a new theme, um, new colors, um, icons and buttons, and giving you the ability to do inline editing um, and a number of system properties. So some things are just easier to view. So if I just go back here, I'm just going to go back to the list here. I'm going to bring up schedule just so you can see uh, the changes in the colors and in the um, it's just softer um, easier on the eyes the fonts are more consistent um, we used to have yellow here now we have purple this is all configurable you can make it whatever colors you you want but 
we're just trying to do the um, out of the box the maximum set of colors. Um, so if I want to make changes in line, I can do things like just change this um, two hour duration to a six hour duration. It changes it here. The load changes all automatically. So it's not available on every field, but most of the um, fields that um, we've been asked for before have been done. So I can um, take out words and add words to the description of a task or a work order. So it gives you that inline editing. Um, another thing that we've done is calendar exports. So when you're in graphical assignment or graphical work week, you can select one or more labor and export um, their assignments into ICS files and they can be either downloaded or emailed directly to those um, labor and um, they can just import them into, I mean it's an ICS file so it can be imported into any of uh, the major um, mail uh, software. Um, we've also got new um, and well not new but we have a new assignment, one new assignment report for crews monthly, I believe it was, and um, the other ones for uh, labor and crews daily and monthly. They've been all um, revamped and available in Graphical Work Week as well as Graphical Assignment. Graphical, or sorry, compliance. Um, we had a little bit of a mismatch between our compliance um, and our rolling projects. So we revamped it so that they work in unison together. Um, we had, I believe it was 26 RFEs um, with 80 something votes that we also cleared off in this release. And of course, with every release, we have security and performance that we have um, improved upon as we go through. So this is, oh, I have a screen to show you the graphical um, view showing you the theme, uh, the inline editing. It's telling you here which fields we have um, added. And then this is what your calendar um, export of ICS files can look in um, an Outlook um, view. So you can see the appointments one after the other uh, for uh, thinking this person's working really um, a night shift, <laughs> look at it, <laughs> really um, early hours for them. And then uh, lastly, I have uh, resources. So the community, uh, we used to have a wiki, and with um, the changes with IBM, we've gone over to an IBM community. You will, we give you the link here. Um, but if you Google Community Maximo Scheduler, you'll find us and you will need to join before you see the content. And of course, because we work um, through RFEs on and what's next in our uh, development, there's a link here for the RFE tool so you can add requirements for moving forward. So I actually think I talk so fast that I have extra time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, Lori, because we do have a couple questions in the chat window. Excellent. So the, the first question is on the side uh, where it showed removing the constraint. Where did the constraint come from? Is it built in scheduler? So this is in Maximo uh, work order tracking and in job plans um, that creates them. This is your predecessor successor with your you know, you can do finish to finish, finish to start, start to start, start to finish. Um, yeah. OK, and the next question we've got for the longer uh, term strategy, are there any significant plans for scheduler, um, the maximum eight time frame that can be shared yet? Uh, so I can take that, uh, Laurie, right? So, sure. uh, so there is a long term roadmap which has been published for maximal EM on going on uh, the maximal application uh, suite, right? And uh, so so I believe, you know, the roadmap which has been published shows uh, uh, 
Q1 for when uh, Maximo would be there and uh, Maximo application uh, suite, right? So as part of that, uh, we'd be, you know, part of that, uh, uh, you know, availability, right? Perfect. Well, thank you guys. Uh, I don't think we have any more chat. Yeah, I think I see some other questions. Oh, yeah, we do. Uh, we have another one. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the next question is, assignment manager is not being replaced by this version of scheduler and will remain as is. Yeah, we're not touching the assignment manager, but it will not get upgraded, I don't think. Um, anything that's new and exciting will come into the graphical um, work week and graphical assignment. Great. Uh, I do have one other, not a question, interested in SMART's transition from time-based to meter-based PM generation lessons learned. So we can always follow that up. Um, we do have contact information as well um, on the PowerPoint slides that will be posted on the site. With that, uh, thank you. You IBM team for the latest and greatest in Maximal Scheduler 768. You're more than welcome. Thanks for the attention. You betcha. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. So I know waiting patiently in the wings, uh, Chris Winston with Project Tech, uh, they do have a, uh, a new community that they've launched, which is the more Community, which is a maximal online resource and education, which is great. I, I actually joined it a few weeks ago and uh, there is a lot of good content and information out there. So with that, uh, Chris Winston with Project Tech, I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to review this with the community. Uh, transportation holds a special place in my heart, having spent a year at Amtrak and living in the Northeast corridor for a decade or so. and riding many trains in many cities. So um, I, I definitely was looking forward to this. I really appreciate it. And Joe has taken the day off today, so it's just going to be me. Uh, uh, OK. <laughs> so <laughs> there we go. So what we've done is we, we've set up this community um, really to provide as a resource for questions uh and answers and communication around maximo specifically around maximum so a little bit about project tech uh first uh the company no oh, there it goes there's the slide i was looking for the slide <laughs> so uh project tech's been around uh quite a bit we've been providing maximo though for about 21 years over the internet um a lot of different industries uh, a lot of different companies a lot of different types of installations. We support all three databases, Oracle, SQL Server, and DB2. And effectively, we are also Maximal users. So we use it every day um, because our support runs through Maximo. So you send a support ticket in, it goes into Maximo, it gets assigned. So we, we live in both sides of it. We support it, uh, we use it, and we have questions internally. We have uh, worked with a number of the other communities, but I think as part of uh, you know the wiki going away and just the idea of kind of having one place that's maximal centric and I'll show you a couple of differences in a second, but really wanted to make sure this was available, uh, easily accessible for folks to use. Uh, I've even, uh, well, my phone fell asleep, but I'll show you uh, a little look at that as well on the phone uh, on a mobile device if you want to see that as well. Um, but specifically about the, the community itself, uh, you know, it's Maximal Online Resources and Education is just, just an idea that came up late last year. Uh, we went into beta in April and the community went live in May. And based on some of the feedback, uh, what we've done is we, we've been making changes and that's going to continue. Uh, yeah, we had a pretty good idea of what we needed to start with. And as we're getting more questions that are coming up, uh, we're, we're making some changes in some of the indexing and how things are, are organized just to make it a little easier for people to find things now that more and more content is actually showing up. Uh, and that's going to be essentially an ongoing process. Um, it's free. Uh, we look forward to keeping it free. 
And there are a number of things that are available to you. In fact, I'll we'll, we'll take a look at that. There are a number of things that are available to you actually before you join the community. Uh, a lot of the content is available to you. Um, you can search, you can view posts, uh, you can look at events, and, and the events will typically be maximal events. So we'll give you an email address here as you see at the bottom. Uh, if you want to send in a maximal event that you want to have posted, we have a number of people who just post them directly, uh, but it needs to be a maximal event. Uh, if it's not a maximal event, it, you know, you, you probably won't see it there. Um, once you do join, though, you get some additional resources that are available to you. Um, you can reply to the repost. You can actually create your own, ask your own questions. Um, you know, and there, there, there are more and more things that are going to be available to you uh, as we go forward um, with the the process of evolving the community. Uh, but you know, I don't know. Let's just go ahead and let's just get into it. Uh, let's see. Let's. You know, that's my phone still full of sleep. All right. So uh, this is the community itself. I haven't logged in yet. Actually, let's get that guy out of the way. All right. So uh, this is it. You just just come to moremaximal.com and you have access to content. These are individual posts. Uh, looks like this latest latest one's on REST, OSLC API. Yeah. Technical. I, I remember what REST is. I can't remember what OSLC is, but that's not the idea. The idea is, you know, whether it's technical or functional, it's going to be here. Um, what we've also done over time is over here, you see popular content, and essentially what's happened is um, we set up a series of tags that people can use to tag their posts. Uh, there have been some other people have created additional tags, and basically as the volume increases and changes, uh, we've tried to put popular content out here to make it easier to access. And let's say we're looking for, you know, that looks like an integration. So you can click on integrations and, you know, you'll see there's a, a bit of content here. There's 14 entries, uh, but over on the left side, there's individual categories that you can look at as well. If there's something that you're looking for from someone specific, hmm, not sure what I'm doing with integration, but it looks like I did something as well. Uh, so you, you have the capability to help you filter in the list. If you want, on the other hand, uh, to simply look for something. Uh, hierarchy. The forms of inflection in descriptions and Maximo similar here. So I, I asked for hierarchy in the singular. I got hierarchies as well. Uh, so it will do that type of a search for you. And again, you know, you'll get uh, a list of them, you know, and you may have a second page to go through and you can keep going through that as well. You'll see individual tags that have been associated with it also. And again, you'll have uh, essentially the ability to further refine the list. You know, and the idea is rather than, you know, eventually we'll probably, we have sub communities as well and have things isolated into certain areas. Um, you know, mobile may be the next community that comes up, but for right now, everything's in this primary open forum. And then we just give you the freedom to sort of select um, either by looking through them individually, by keywords. Uh, and there are some other things that you can do as well um, with regards to uh, some other pieces that have come up um, about, I don't know, maybe a month ago, we made, made another change and create a separate community uh, section around certifications because the, the three maximum seven, six certifications that are available became available for you to take from home. You don't have to, you know, work from your office. You don't have to go into a testing center. So all that information is here. Uh, and then of course, you know, you can get the actual information and then do the registration as well. And then of course you sign in with your Pearson credentials and you just kind of follow the process on from there. Um, my main point here though, I've done all this and I'm yet to log in to the community. I, I haven't logged in yet at all. Um, so we do try and provide you with access to most of the content uh, without actually joining and accepting the terms. And the terms are just, you know, kind of play nice with others. 
um, when you're in in the uh, the forum. Is that there is a possibility if we have certain things there that are discussed that are really not appropriate, then you know you'll you'll see your post gets deleted. Um, you might get put on probation. You know we'll send you an email and we'll ask you to you know. Uh, uh, keep it civil and and then we can move on. Uh, we're not trying to police this heavily. We really just want the community's involvement and and there's quite a lot of people working in Maximo. Uh, the transportation alone, a lot of the Northeast corridor. Uh, L I double R. Uh, Jersey Transit, the T um, Amtrak. You know, I know that one well. You know, yeah, so there, there's a lot of Maximo users that are out there, and there's a lot of input that is is there and available. We want to try and get that and and get it focused on Maximo and as civil a tone as we can. Um, somewhere around here, I have uh, there it is. I have a browser that's actually logged in. So <laughs> that's that's Opera. This is Chrome. Try to make it. Uh, it's not quite browser agnostic, but we're getting close. Uh, but in this case, I'm actually signed in to Maximo, so I have access to now Maximo resources, which is, and also I can reply to a post or I can create a new one. Those are the the biggest differences you get when you um, join. And it, you know, there are different categories of, of resources that are here and available. Uh, and if I have one that I want to look at, like uh, modify lookup XML. So in this case, there's some information about it. it. Looks like there's a short video as well and a tag. There's a place for you to put a tag in as well uh, when you're doing a post. And one other thing, if this is something that's important to you and you want to follow developments on it, there is an icon here which you can follow it and then get notified on it. And that way, if there are changes to it, you'll get an email. Uh, you'll be able to manage your subscriptions as well as part of your profile so that you can choose to get a daily digest um, or let's see where they go. Oh yeah, and these are these are individual interests that you may have. You can put information about yourself in here as well. Um, and let's see, my account and email preferences. And this is where I can choose uh, what I'm going to subscribe to. So, you know, if yes just means, you know, get the email. They're generally a daily digest. You can get something more frequent if you want. Um, but you have the flexibility. And of course, you can just say, no, you don't want it. You just want to be able to come in and look when you want to look, and you don't want the email. Uh, and that is perfectly viable. That's why the setting is there and available to you. And it's up to you to choose um, what you want to have in it with the application. And with that, uh, oh, I wanted to show you the mobile. Uh, let's see, where is that? That's back in Opera. And of course, yeah, it fell asleep. Oh, come on, wake up. There we go. So yeah, this, this is, is really a great resource as well, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> and this is my phone. Uh, and you know, you'll see that essentially I'm logged in here as well. And it's the same content. Uh, it just renders differently because it's on a phone. And the, the only real significant major difference is the hamburger icon. And that's where you get all the other navigation, including the search where you can put in uh, an individual term and go look and see what it has that's available for it. And that's really about all I had. Uh, but again, really thank you for the opportunity to, to discuss this. And I hope you guys will join. And if not, if you don't want to join, mm -hmm. just come on over and take a look. More Maximo. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Chris, so much. And and what a great resource uh, to have available to all the Maximo community as well, because I know in uh, facilitating and hosting a lot of user group meetings in the past, I would typically pull the audience and ask them, you know, how much Maximo training do you really get annually? 
And the majority of the folks, you know, would raise their hand and say, this is really the only Maximo training we get after our implementation. Um, so this is a great resource and, and training tool uh, and Project X has done a great job in putting this together. So it's one of the reasons I wanted to uh, extend the opportunity for you go, you folks to uh, discuss a little bit about more. So we have learned more about more. So <laughs> thanks, Chris. <laughs> Thank appreciate you. Appreciate it. it. And there, there, there's plenty of videos and a lot of the attachments that go with it that we can't put on YouTube. You know, we've put into the into the community as well just to make it easier to that to navigate awesome great thank you so much well that's uh wrapping up our two and a half hours just a just a couple closing comments is uh please reach out to me if you'd like to be involved with our next transportation webinar this winter uh, we're already in the planning stages and have some great pre presentations and demos that are already lined up uh, for the winter meeting. So send me a note um, if you'd like to get involved with it. I know there are some folks that have already reached out to me uh, that uh, would like to participate in the winter meeting coming up. Um, I'd like to give a big Maximo thank you to all our presenters today. Uh, as mentioned in the beginning of the meeting that you can access the recorded webinar and download the individual presentations on the IBM Transportation Communities website. If you haven't joined the IBM Transportation Community website, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, there is a lot of good information there and you can kind of network with people within the transportation community of Maximo, um, as well as being uh, posted on the ZPro Solutions events website. Uh, thanks you all for attending the meeting and we will see you in the winter. All be safe out there. Thank you so much. Thanks Scott. Take good care. Thank you all. Thank you Scott.